Now let's look at the subject of the tabernacle in Exodus, primarily Exodus 25 to 26, where we read about this tabernacle which is constructed by God. The instructions are given very deliberately, very specifically to the people to build this tabernacle or tent. Now, by way of introduction, we should note that ancient people were all about tabernacles and temples. In the ancient worldview, to come into the presence of the divine, whether that's the gods, plural, or God, singular, or the, the all, um, you needed some kind of a, a, a room, some kind of a space, a sacred space or area, and they called these temples. And this was kind of a nexus, you could say, between the natural and the supernatural and the transcendent and the imminent. Uh, picture those sci-fi movies that you see, Stargate, for example, with Kurt Russell, great film, where you've got a portal and you've got to get through the portal to get to the other world. That's sort of what a temple was. A temple is going into that space and location, that, that stargate, that, that little, little way through to get into the presence of the divine. You don't just bump into the divine. You don't just come into the presence of God or the gods or the all. You need a temple. You need a sacred space. And so we can read from a uh, historian of religion, Mircea Eliade. He's a very famous uh, scholar of comparative religions. He says that the dividing structure between the sacred and profane space, profane meaning normal, profane normal space serves the purpose of preserving profane man from the danger to which he would expose himself by entering it without due care. You don't just walk into the temple either. If there is a temple and you're profane man, you don't just come into the, the sacred's presence. That's why they have all of the, the washings and the cleansings and the, the, the incense and the ritual to come into the temples in comparative religion. This is something that's, that's universal, it's ubiquitous across religion. You have sacred spaces, and to get into the sacred space, you don't just waltz in. You have to do the rituals, do the prayers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eliade says this, he says, the sacred is always dangerous to anyone who comes into contact with it unprepared without having gone through the gestures of approach that every religious act demands. Elsewhere, he refers to his mentor, Rudolf Otto, who set himself to discover the characteristics of this frightening and irrational experience. Frightening and irrational. Postmodern people have lost this. When you speak of God, a postmodern person thinks of God like a, a warm blanket in a downy commercial that you hug and you hold on to and it's nice and fluffy. That's God. It's very lovey-dovey and wonderful and sweet and, oh, God. God is very comfortable and he's your buddy. Uh, not according to world religion. I hope you know that. I, I hope you know that's a very 21st century or, or latter half of the 20th century postmodern deconstructionist view. The God is just very lovey-dovey and loving. That's not a view that's across the world when it comes to religion. Eliade, Otto, say that the normal, normal uh, experience of a person coming into the presence of God, what they call a numinous experience, uh, numens meaning God in Latin, to come into the presence of God, the other, the transcendent, the all, is terrifying. To be a man, to be a, a woman, to be, to be a, a worm in the presence of, of God. They use the word ineffable. Have you ever heard that word? It's, it's close encounters of the third kind when you see the spaceship. It's, it's, it's looking at it and just trying to describe it. What is it? I can't, it's ineffable to come into the presence of the all, the other. God, it's, it's terrifying. It's irrational. They, pe people, when they experience God, don't know what to do with it, is what they're saying. He finds the feeling of terror before the sacred, before the awe-inspiring mystery, the mysterium tremendum, uh, fascinus, at fascinus, that's Latin, mysterium meaning mysterium, mysterious, tremendum meaning awe, awe-inspiring, full of awe, awful, and fascinus meaning um, 
to be a, a, to be a lord. You're, you're scared. You're terrified. It's mysterious. It's ineffable. And yet you want to draw near to it. You're fascinated by it. He finds the feeling of terror before the awe-inspiring mystery that emanates an overwhelming superiority of power. God presents itself as something wholly other, something basically and totally different. It is like nothing human or cosmic. Confronted with it, man senses his profound nothingness, feels that he is only a creature. That is, that is, that is what we see in comparative religion. None of this God is warm and fuzzy stuff. God is, in the words of Isaiah 6, holy, 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 other, other, other is the Lord Almighty. He is distinct. He is, uh, it's hard to even explain. In fact, we read through our Bibles after Isaiah gets that vision of the throne room in Isaiah 6. What does he say? Oh God, this is so wonderful to be in your presence. He says, woe is me, for I am ruined. Moses, when he comes into God's presence at the burning bush, hides his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Abraham said when he spoke to God, I am but dust and ashes, Genesis 18. When Peter met the Lord Jesus on the second time on the Sea of Galilee after the big catch of fish, he says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And eventually, all people, either out of their free will or compulsory, will need to bow their knee to King Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You'll either do that, as, as C.S. Lewis put it, there's no use in surrendering after the army has already come into the nation. Now is the time to surrender. But this picture, I, I hope maybe as we were reading that, you're thinking, oh, but not the Bible. Yes, the Bible. Yes, the Bible has a, um, frankly, a frightening view of God, that he, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And yet, what's the solution? How can people encounter a God like this? You need a temple. You don't just come into his presence. You don't just waltz into God's presence like he's your buddy. You need to come through a temple. Here's the odd part that makes the tabernacle which later became the temple under the reign of Solomon, very unique in the Jewish sense, it moved. Sacred space is supposed to be that we demarcate a certain area where we come into, a, uh, ancient man would come into a certain area and then sense, oh yeah, this is sacred. And then they, they put some rocks around it and then they build up those rocks and build a, a cave and then all of a sudden that would be a temple. This is a holy space. Holy spaces are localized to the deity. God said, I don't want a temple. You're trying to build me a temple, David? You, first of all, you got blood on your hands. I don't want you to build it. I don't want a temple. I got a mobile home and it's fine. Right? I'll, I'll stick with my RV. And whenever I want to move, you pick up the stakes and you move. And wherever I go, that's where the temple goes. That's where the tabernacle goes. It's movable. And inside this tabernacle, you had all of these different uh, devices, religious devices. You had the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, the bread of the presence. And all of these things here were ways to come into the holy place. So there, there, were, there were two sections. First, the, the, the priest could come into the holy place and interact with all these religious paraphernalia. But, but then you needed this guy here, the high priest. He could go into the holy of holies, the most holy place, where he would come into contact with the Ark of the Covenant. Perhaps you've seen Indiana Jones, where the whole, the whole premise is about the Ark of the Covenant. Until Indiana Jones 4, where it's not about Christianity or Judaism, it's about Scientology. It's about aliens. But at this point in Spielberg's career, it's about Judaism and Christianity. And the Ark of the Covenant is the center of that film. Well, the Ark of the Covenant is basically a box, which we'll explore in a minute, designed to demonstrate all of the ways in which the Jewish people failed God. And of course, there's a big, big veil here. You don't just go from the outside of the tabernacle to the inside. You got to get through a veil. And once you get into the holy place, you don't just go from the holy place to the holiest place, the holy of holies. There's another veil. In fact, there's only one guy that goes in there, and he goes in there once a year on the day, Yom, of atonement, Kippur. 
the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. One guy, once a year, goes in there on the Day of Atonement. And according to Exodus 28, the high priest would, quote, carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment over his heart. As the high priest would go into God's terrifying and frightening presence, he would come in after doing all the washings and all the incense and the sacrifice, and he would come into God's presence with the names of the people written over his heart, carrying the names of the people into God's presence. And he would, quote, bear the guilt involved in the sacred gifts the Israelites would consecrate. They will be acceptable to the Lord. So one man would carry the names, and if you know in the Bible, name isn't just some kind of a name. It represents the person. He would carry their names in with them, and then this would, would, would be carrying their guilt in with them. For what purpose? Well, to get into the Holy of Holies and to see the Ark of the Covenant. It, well, what's the Ark of the Covenant? Is this just from the movies? No, it's from the Bible. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were three things. One, you had Aaron's staff, his rod. And if you remember in the story of Numbers chapter 16 and 17, Moses' leadership was challenged. And God said, if you want to see who, who's the one I'm getting behind, you take Aaron's rod, his staff, and you take the other staff, and, and we'll put these next to each other. And tomorrow, whichever, whichever of these staffs bud, you grow flowers or whatever, that's the one that I'm behind. That's whose leadership I'm behind. And sure enough, it was Aaron's staff that budded. The people rebelled against Aaron and Moses' leadership. And so God said, I want you to take that staff and I want you to put it in the Ark of the Covenant. This is kind of like a forensic box. If you were an attorney trying to prosecute, you would say, Exhibit A, get the blood splatter, get the fingerprints, get the eyewitness testimony written. Get Aaron's rod and put that in the forensic box where they rejected my leadership. And then two, we have God's provision, the manna. Remember the story of the people coming out of Exodus and under the slavery and, and in a terrible moment of a dark comedy, the people say, we keep eating this manna. It just tastes disgusting. It's like coriander seed. And it, I know there's plenty, and I know it's nutritious. It's, you know, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But do you, do you remember back in Egypt, man? Do you remember in Egypt, man? Remember that meat? Remember the steaks we used to have in Egypt? I know the infanticide, yeah, but the meat. Remember the meat? I know the, the back-breaking slave, chattel slavery labor. Yeah, that was back in four centuries. But man, the meat they had in Egypt. And they grumbled against the Lord. For what? For his provision. They said, this isn't good enough. God was providing everything they needed. wasn't good enough. So what does he do? He says, I want you to take that and put that into the forensic box. And then third, the people, right after they get rescued, God didn't ask them to be moral and then rescue them. Let me repeat that. God didn't give them the Ten Commandments in Egypt. Say, follow all these and then I'll rescue you from your, your evil ruler. He said, first, I'm going to rescue you by grace. Then I'm going to take you out, and then I'm going to give you my moral instructions. Sound familiar? Well, they get the moral instructions. And uh, I think one of those on there is uh, do not create any graven images. right? Maybe like the first three on there. Like, don't do that. Like, on heaven above or earth below. Don't do that. Don't. Uh, and so Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days, is it? And he's up there and down at the base of the mountain. Uh, Aaron is there, the, you know, the high priest, the holy, the holy man. They get the idea to create a golden calf, Exodus 32. They collect some of the gold that they had pillaged and pilfered from Egypt when they left, and they built the Ark of the Covenant with it. Then they took some of the other gold that they stole from the Egyptians. Really, I think it was back pay for 400 years of slavery. But they take that and they build a golden calf with it. And it says that they had pagan revelry under the golden calf. That is about the most PG translation. The, in Hebrew, it's orgies. They had naked orgies. And so Joshua is up on the mountain with Moses, and he says, I think I hear war. And Moses says, that's not war. <laughs> they get to the bottom of the mountain, and they see a, 
pagan altar to a calf and it's golden. All the, all the money that was taken to build God's future, for the, going into the land, and they're going to need this money. And, and it's being used for this, this pagan altar. And there's orgies. And, it's, and Moses just takes the, 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 the stone tablets and he shatters them. And he has to rewrite them. God says that, uh, okay, we need those. So he <laughs> rewrites those. Makes Moses write them that time. And I want you to put that into the box, the forensic box. And so what are we seeing here? All right, God's leadership was rejected. God's provision was rejected. And God's moral character is rejected. And so we're looking in the forensic box. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And you have the cherubim, you know, cherub, singular, cherubim, plural, cherubs, looking down at the top of the box, looking down into the, into the forensic box, the Ark of the Covenant. And they're saying they are guilty. It's so clear that they're guilty. What's the solution? You're, you're probably going to guess it. As they see the depravity of humanity, the solution is a sacrifice. An innocent lamb is slaughtered, and the blood is placed over the top of what's called the mercy seat, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And so now, when the angels go to look down at the evidence, guilty, 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 rejecting God's leadership, his provision, his character, they don't see the rejection of his leadership or his provision or his character. All they see is the blood of an innocent substitute. Guys, thousands of gallons of blood spilled. 1,500 years this was done every year, Yom Kippur, year after year after year. What does it all point to? It points to one who would come in the future, who would be the true sacrifice, who could actually pay for sins in the most holy of places. We read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever, not annually, not on Yom Kippur, forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. Do you have any idea how outrageous it is that what we just read there? That is absolutely, uh, what? You're saying... <laughs> To come into the presence of God, we need a temple. Everyone knows that. We all know that in the ancient Near East. They know that on the other side of the world, Eastern religions, West. We all need a temple, and you need to sacrifice. You need to wash and cleanse yourself, and you need to come into the temple pure. And maybe you can't even do it, but you send a guy, and he goes in for you. And that guy goes in and takes care of this. This says that we can come to God through Jesus. Jesus is the temple. John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> the listener said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days? And John records, but this, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Not just um, that Jesus is the temple, but the destruction of his temple and the rebuilding, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the way through which we come to God. Not through a building, but through a person. Hebrews 9.11, Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all and secured our redemption forever. And so we can read, in the opening chapter of the gospel, according to John, the word, Jesus, became flesh and skinao, dwelt, is most translations. So he dwelt among us. Literally, skinao is the word tabernacled. Remember, David said, I want to I build you a temple. And God says, I don't want a temple. No, I really want to build you a temple. Well, I'll let Solomon build the temple, 1 Kings 6. I don't want a temple. I want a tabernacle. I want to be movable. I want to be on earth. And where I go, you follow. Why? Because this was all predictive of Jesus that he would tabernacle not in a building, but in a person. 